Hi guys, Jonathan here again with another What Is This Weapon? And um, I feel like I'm always saying this, but this one is particularly fun and interesting and really quite rare as well. Not many of these left in the world. What I like about this most of all is how Star Wars it looks. <laughs> um, it is a very important historic firearm in its own right, but um, something about this, especially without a magazine, which I'll explain in a minute, really does make it look like some sort of handy blaster of some kind. Um, covered in wood, of course, which I'll, I'll explain again in a moment. Now, if, you were, if you've been um, guessing along over on social media, I think you've done very well if you've managed to, if, well, if you knew what this was, lots of, lots of credit there. If you've managed to Google it up, you've done well there, frankly, because there's not much available online on this. So what is this? Um, this is one of several designs by um, an interesting Swiss designer um, with the slightly unfortunate name of Adolf Führer, not Führer, who seems to have started designing um, at the end of the First World War and certainly inspired by the events of the First World War because this thing is clearly a take on the submachine gun, a new concept at the end of the war. In fact, it's really very early when you think about it. We have the Bergman MP18, actually deployed and successful. We have some contemporary Italian designs that, as far as we know, never made it to the front. So this coming in in 1919, we believe this is known as the MP19, or it certainly is known now as the MP19. This is really quite an early design, which sort of explains its rather funky proportions and configuration and all of that, which we'll have a look at in a moment. Um, so Fura was a relatively senior, I believe, Swiss army officer and Oberst Brigadier. I'm not quite sure what that is, but it sounds pretty senior to me. So one of a number of guys who, with military experience who turned their hand to trying to improve their country's small arms. Um, he had a, a, a hit and miss career, I think it's safe to say, with his designs. We have several in the collection, not all of them by any means. Um, in fact, the one that you might have come across over on Forgotten Weapons, the MP4144, we actually don't have an example of. And that was not a very successful submachine gun. As the name would imply, that was a Second World War design for Nazi Germany. Um, so back to 1919, one of Führer's first attempts is this. Now, it's conventional in one way, and probably one way only, and that is this rather conspicuous Luger-esque toggle mechanism here. Uh, we lift the, in fact, I'll show you that now. Rather than, pivot, pivot this around, rather than a slide or reciprocating bolt carrier, see the toggle is, is broken here, as it were, broken upwards, which is how it works. When the gun fires, you can actually see there the barrel which is attached to what would be the slide if this was a pistol, moves to the rear, and the shape of these ears here causes the toggle buttons to strike them and then be lifted upwards, all automatically, so you don't have to manually cock it. Now this way of locking the gun so that all of that pressure is contained and does what it needs to do and doesn't blow up and all of that is not super common in the history of firearms, but iconically associated with the Luger. Um, originating on the C93 Borkart pistol, but actually it goes back further than that. It appeared first in the Winchester series of lever action rifles. It was also used in the Maxim machine gun we're talking here about the mechanical principle of the thing, not the specific design. This is taken from the Luger, which is taken from the Borkart. Um, but the basic principle of um, the usual comparison is an arm or a, or a knee joint, so that when it's straight, it's, it's solid and it's locked and it's not going anywhere and all your pressure is contained. If you break the joint by pushing it against the surface, so these surfaces here, then it will fold and you can extract, eject, and chamber the next round. So it's a, it's a very clever and very good system. It's relatively complex 
and therefore expensive. And there are just better ways to do it. Some sort of reciprocating block with a bolt in it, or in the case of a pistol, a slide with a dropping or a tilting or a rotating barrel turned out to be the better way to go. But this does lift from, and here is a, an appropriately Swiss take on the Luger, the original um, 765 caliber Luger. These are really beautifully made things uh, with the Swiss cross sort of sunburst device on them. This is a super rare, interesting firearm in its own right. One of the very early Lugers. Um, so the model of 1899. And Fura takes that idea and applies it to a load of fully automatic firearms rather than just semi-automatic. Um, we're not here to, to cover all of those today, but I did grab one other, which is sat next to me here, because what we're looking at here is essentially the same gun encased in a wooden stock with a butt stock for shouldering it and a conventional trigger and trigger guard. Whereas this is the exact same mechanism, virtually identical, with a set of spade grips on the back of it. And if I bring them together, you'll see what I mean. So, same thing, basically a giant Luger mechanism flipped onto its side. There'd be a magazine coming in here on the side. We don't have the magazine for this. We don't have the magazine for this either, but I have one from another gun to show you what it, what it looked like. So all of this is basically the same as what's in this gun, but it has a really chunky set of spade grips and a button trigger on the back because this is essentially a uh, single barrel equivalent to a Villa Perosa, um, one of the uses of which was on aircraft. So this was very much, very like, this was con um, conceived for an aircraft observer. Very compact, but high rate of fire, pistol caliber, but you get close and it would do the job. We have two other Fura guns that are double versions of this, basically. And in fact, that's where that one of those I have borrowed the magazine from because it's the same basic design as the magazine for this. Um, how do we know? Because there's a slightly more complete, better condition <laughs> example of this in the uh, Ruag Museum. Ruag being a modern um, uh, sort of multinational, but um, they, they do um, ammunition manufacture, for example. They have a number of historic companies bound up in them and they have their own museum and they have one of these with a couple of bits that we don't. So one is the magazine. So I have just borrowed this to give you a vague idea of what this would look like with a magazine fitted. Very steep curve to it. Yeah, I can just push it into the, the aperture, but it won't lock home. Um, and it's not really a color match either. This, this thing being still in the white, unfinished, it's a prototype. And this being from a completed gun, it's got a blued finish. But you get the idea, long, curved, um, and with, a, with witness slots in the side. So you can see how many rounds you have left. But not from this gun. We are missing the magazine. We are missing a bracket underneath for mounting a very large wooden clad monopod slash foregrip, um, which you if you have a look for the um, other museum example that we know of, that still has it. Now on the opposite side of this slot for the missing bracket are two holes, two attachment holes there. And those are through and through holes to here. So <laughs> this is an extremely robust mounting system for that vertical monopod that you could grab and use as a foregrip or sit as, well, a monopod, a mount for your gun. So you'd have it in the shoulder and then resting on that, on that mount. Um, so that's really quite robust engineering there to make sure that you're not putting undue stress on the wooden casing or stock as we used to call it. Now Fura seems to have been a bit obsessed with this Luger toggle lock mechanism and, and put it on just about everything. Um, in this case, what that means is you've actually got the toggle flying out to the side where your left arm might be, depending on how you're holding this. Now, I don't think that's a serious problem because you shouldn't have your arm up there, uh, but it is a consideration. 
today people worry about reciprocating cocking handles, well, this thing's flying out. Um, I mean, it might be a little off-putting having that happen in front of your face as well, um, but that's very subjective. So I think it's, it's a sound enough design, it's just a bit unconventional to have it on the side rather than on the top. And there isn't really a clear reason why that would be, unless Furrow was working to some requirement for a sideways feed. So similar to the MP18 Bergman, this thing feeds uh, from the side, the magazine sticking out to the side. Unlike the Bergman, it's feeding right to left, which is pretty unconventional, um, and makes for an interesting sort of manual of arms as to how he would load the thing. So the mechanism aside, that's, that's quite straightforward. Um, the stock kind of apes a conventional rifle or carbine, quite quaint sort of Winchester style curved pointy butt plate there. That seems to be just a stylistic flourish, although I suppose it would help lock it into the shoulder in automatic fire. Um, other features that we can identify, obviously we have the magazine catch here, fairly conventionally rocking. The rear sight is just a little notch, pretty standard for a submachine gun, but if you pinch in and pull up, you can actually raise it one notch, which actually puts it pretty high up the gun there, which of course brings up your front sight and means you're shooting out to longer range in a sort of arcing trajectory. But you have to be a bit careful because if you, if you tug too hard, the whole thing comes off. This is a prototype. And the front sight is a, is a pretty conventional dovetailed in um, blade there. Some of the rest of this is for taking it apart. So we have a, we have a pin here to secure the um, stock. I'm not gonna mess with that. Um, what I can do is pop off the top or side cover here. So the upper hand guard effectively. This is a little bit awkward to pull off because we have a, a plunger both sides and we have to maintain pressure on the side we've just released. There we go, we should do it. Nope, nope, the other side has popped back in as I thought it might. There we go. So just a simple wooden handguard with a, a lug at the front to secure it into this nose cap arrangement here, which is pretty close to this, but not the same to the aircraft gun. And then this just this metal strap to secure it on the plungers at the back. That's as far as we'll go taking it apart. Um, there's a fair bit of charring, I would suggest, in there, or dark, like heat darkening of the wood. So I think this has seen some serious firing. But with that off, we can now see just how similar this is to its contemporary aircraft gun equivalent. Even the front sight arrangement is basically the same on there. This, this nose cap is different, but the barrel being fluted for weight um, so basically just metal cut out all around its um, diameter. And the action is functionally identical. Um, there is a slight difference, I believe, in the magazine housing shape. That's about it. So they really are... Um, they really are variants of the same idea. But this one is handheld, so you can run around with it in the trenches or whatever it is that you're hoping to use it for. Incidentally, the other direct connection with the Luger, other than the toggle mechanism, the reciprocating upper part of the gun, or the side part of the gun in this case, is the cartridge type. So we don't have the, the magazine, um, but we know that it is 7.65 Luger, so 7.65 by 21 millimeters. Um, before we had the nine millimeter Luger, we had the 7.65. Luger, and that's what this Swiss Luger is chambered for. So Fura took the mechanism of the Luger and he took the cartridge of the Luger, but that's not surprising. The Swiss armed forces already had the Luger as a pistol and they already had that cartridge as their standard cartridge type. So it's not so much him, um, well, partly him choosing the mechanism he clearly has an affinity with, but it's also to do with what's familiar to, or going to be familiar to the user had this thing ever made it to frontline use or any kind of use actually. Um, in case you're wondering how the trigger actually fires this thing, um, 
those of you who know the Luger know this already, but under this cover plate is a linkage between the trigger and essentially a, um, a metal hinge on the side of the gun. And all the trigger is doing is pressing that in to release the firing pin in very basic terms. Uh, the Fura does the same thing. And I can demonstrate that for you. So cock it. And in close up, when I pull that trigger gently, you'll see a rod moving to the rear there. And there's this hooked portion at the front. And we pull that all the way through. And that is literally just using a lever to release the firing pin. Basically the same trigger mechanism as the Luger. Um, just a little more crude, at least it is in this prototype. From there, we have to work out what this is, um, which is something that I've only just figured out, <laughs> full disclosure. We have a button here. Pressing that button allows you to pull across this tab and that blocks the trigger bar from tilting and therefore from releasing the firing pin. So we can pull that all day long and it won't fire. So we cock it again. Press the button, pull the tab across. See that end of the bar is being blocked, can't move, not just by our label, can't move. And then press the button, push the tab in and the gun can fire. So quite a weird safety mechanism requiring you to push something in and pull something out. So thinking about how that would work in use, I think you would have to, with your firing hand, push up and then with your non-firing hand, pull the tab across. Makes sense to me. So a very positive safety mechanism, it's gonna prevent the gun from firing and can be quite hard to accidentally disengage, but a bit of a three-handed job to put on. Now there's a fairly glaring feature on this that I haven't entirely figured out because I don't want to attempt to fully take this apart um, on camera. I have a theory, um, if you agree, let me know. If you don't, also let me know. So this big drum on the side is designed to be pulled out. And when I do that, the whole mechanism slides forward, which I think is a clue as to what it's for. And then you can rotate it so that it can't pop back in. So it's retaining something, and then by rotating it, you're, you're making sure it can't pop back in and continue to retain something. And that's something I believe is the whole barreled mechanism. And if I was brave enough to pop out this pin, <laughs> which is so tempting, um, I believe between those two things, we could actually remove the mechanism from the gun. So that's my theory as to what this does. Uh, you'll forgive me for being a little cautious with this museum piece. Um, Perhaps we can revisit with Ian one day. Um, I nearly missed something out here. This trigger guard is actually quite extended and there's a reason for that. There's yet another button on this thing. If you press and slide, it's doing something. <laughs> um, let's test that out. So with it slid to the rear, That appears to be firing automatically. With it slid forward, yeah, I can feel that disconnecting. So that is your fire selector. That is slid forward for semi, press and slide to the rear, not very far, about three millimeters. And now it's on automatic. So, Fire selector inside the trigger guard, not too common, and a wacky safety up here. I think that's all of the weird features <laughs> of this weapon. Um, it really is a fascinating thing. Um, so this one is actually marked serial number six, or is it nine? <laughs> we believe it's a six, because it's facing the, um, the direction of travel, as it were. Um, 
we believe a hundred or so of these were made, no more than that. So more, more than a, a strict prototype, but not to the point of really troop trials or anything like that. Um, there are a handful around, so we know of one in the, in the Ruag Museum, one here. If you know of any others, please do let us know. As to why it didn't catch on, well, as you've seen, it's a little, little clunky with this side toggle mechanism. Toggles weren't really found to be the way forward for, well, much of anything really. The Luger was great in its day, but it had its day and we moved on to simpler mechanisms. So that was always going to be a problem. Um, it is a little chunky and heavy, um, about 4.7 kilos, so more than 10 pounds. So although it's very short, it is hefty. Um, that probably didn't help. And of course, um, fairly quickly into the 1920s, we start to see superior submachine guns. I mean, the Bergman is already a superior submachine gun and that's already been issued um, to the German forces. So this didn't really go anywhere. Um, Führer himself um, did have some success, probably, well, Clearly his greatest success is the K31 rifle, which is, doesn't use a toggle, um, far simpler. It's a straight pull, bolt action, military rifle, standard rifle of the Swiss forces, really very successful. So Führer isn't one of these kind of mad inventors who comes up with something that we just kind of point and laugh at and go, that's an interesting historical um, sidetrack. He's, he's definitely made a contribution to um, the history of firearms development uh, and to military history, but he did have a penchant for interesting, weird stuff as well. So not hugely successful. Um, we think a hundred or so might have been made, no more than that, and they were produced at Waffenfabrik in Bern. Uh, w and F is it's often um, rendered. Uh, they also made the Lugers, and Fura was actually. Uh, in charge of that facility, uh, which might have given him a little bit of a leg up when it comes to um, firearms design and getting his designs um, certainly manufactured, if not necessarily accepted. <laughs> <laughs>